So I'm going to talk about uh, some of the kind of exciting ideas that are floating around now to do with quantum mechanics and in particular uh, topological materials which people are dreaming hopes for uh, a new kind of quantum computers. So today we've really uh, reached a, a new phase in the understanding of quantum mechanics. And the key message of this talk will be that as we, we're now starting to understand quantum mechanics better, and this, this is in the period which people are calling a second quantum revolution because the way of thinking about quantum mechanics has been changing, uh, there's kind of some very surprising new and strange possibilities for the materials of the future are emerging and we hope these are going to bring new kind of technologies uh, into play. <coughs> and this has really been come, come up as a, a series of unexpected and surprise discoveries that have led us to have new ways of thinking about quantum materials. <coughs> so the, the modern laws of quantum mechanics go back a long time. They go back almost 100 years. And, uh, of course, the, the famous... Uh, people who started everything, uh, Schrodinger, Heisenberg, and then Pauli and Dirac. And by the end of this uh, fruitful period, by about 1932, the, the laws of quantum mechanics as we know them today were established. <clears throat> and they stood the test of time, so nothing has changed about the, the fundamental laws of quantum mechanics. And all, all the tests people have done to date have confirmed quantum mechanics is correct. There are very, some very strange issues in quantum mechanics to understand, and, uh, but no one has made their career by, by standing against quantum mechanics, and even, as we'll see, Einstein uh, was wrong about quantum mechanics, but um, Einstein's ideas about quantum mechanics have turned out to be very fruitful for us anyway. So, just because we know the laws of quantum mechanics doesn't mean that we know everything that quantum mechanics allows to happen. And in fact, electromagnetism, the basic laws of electromagnet electromagnetism were, were finished, I guess, in, 19, in 1864. Maxwell had the last of the laws, the four laws of electromagnetism. And... You know, nothing has changed in the basic laws of electromagnetism, but it's taken a long time to discover all the things that electromagnetism allows us to do. And it's not a, it's still a, 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 a front, uh, in the front of research. Many new things are happening in electromagnetism in recent years. For example, photonic crystals has become a big, a big thing. And, and of course, we've had all the things that your TV and your cell phones and everything have emerged from, partly from electromagnetism. So when it was discovered, uh, there's a story that the, the British Prime Minister, I think before he became Prime Minister, who was the economy minister, the finance minister, he asked uh, Faraday, he said, this is all very good, these nice equations, but what are they good for? And Faraday is supposed to said he couldn't tell what it would be good for, but he did know that one day you may tax it. And of course he was correct. So what will happen out of... Quantum mechanics hasn't really been turned into a... Uh, until recently, it, there's been no effort to turn it into a, into a technology. Uh, it's been, of course, around for all sorts of things, but currently we want to try and use quantum mechanics directly for interesting things. So starting around 1980, uh, in condensed matter, new insights into quantum mechanics started to emerge when topological, unexpected states of matter that we now call topological started to be discovered. And in fact, quantum information theory started earlier in the 1950s when Richard Feynman started thinking about what would happen when computers were made smaller and smaller and eventually came down to the atomic scale, which is what is now happening. Moore's law is, is running out of, uh, 
out of space now because the size of the conducting channels in the latest chips are maybe 10 or, 20, 10 or 15 atoms large, and there's no more shrinking them down without hitting quantum mechanics directly. So Feynman started thinking about what would happen on the scale, when, on the atomic scale, if we tried to build computers where and the atomic scale is where quantum mechanics cannot be ignored. <coughs> and uh, these two features of things have come together. There's been a merging of interesting quantum studies of interesting quantum materials in condensed matter theory and the ideas of quantum information theory, which were more abstract. And what's really happening is people are instead of doing experiments where you, 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 you take two particles and smash them together and see what comes out from quantum mechanical interactions, we're doing now probing things very gently and doing, trying to find direct control of quantum states. And that's the central aim of the new approaches to quantum mechanics, to gradually prod and poke quantum states without destroying them and smashing them to find out what goes on. And this has led to what people, some people are saying is the second quantum revolution because after the first one of Heisenberg and Schrodinger and Pauli and Dirac, and people are thinking about quantum mechanics in a, in a quite new way, I think. And that's really what's been going on. And I think we will get some interesting technologies certainly in the next 10 to 20 years, and probably earlier. <coughs> so if you go back to the beginning, of course the earliest ideas of quantum mechanics you see in, in cartoons is the Niels Bohr atom, where, where Bohr came up with the, the picture of the electron orbiting around, uh, around the central nucleus uh, in an orbit. And what he discovered was that to fit this model, the orbits had to, only a certain number of orbits were allowed. But it was basically a picture of something, of little planets, Earth going around the, the sun, except there was a quantum degree, quantum aspect to it that made the orbits you could go in uh, limited. So the Schrodinger picture, uh, combined with Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, turns this orbit of an electron around an atom into a, a fuzzy cloud centered on the nucleus. So in a sense, Bohr's uh, clean orbits became a box that contains the electron because we know in this fuzzy cloud the electron is somewhere in there. It's inside, but we don't exactly know where. So we only know that the electron, if it's bound, is in the box. And Bohr's language has persisted, so we still call these boxes orbitals because it goes back to the idea of the orbit around the sun being transformed into the orbit of the electron around the, the nucleus. So atomical, orbit, atomic orbits, atomical orbitals are boxes into which electrons are put. And uh, forgetting about spin for the moment, uh, this means the box has like two states. There's either an empty with no electron inside it, which would be the hydrogen ion with nothing going around it, or the filled box with an electron, which is like the neutral hydrogen atom with the cloud electron in the cloud localized in the neighborhood of the nucleus. So this box in a modern language has two quantum states, empty or full. And we can call empty zero and full one. And so this is actually the model for what we, what we can call the qubit, the basic uh, element of quantum information, a, a system which has two possible states. <coughs> and so, of course, nowadays we can actually image hydrogen atoms. We can't so far have a nice image of the hydrogen atom in its ground state where the orbit is very, uh, uh, is only a, a small distance, one Bohr radius around the atom. But when we have an excited atom, uh, like this one, uh, a so-called Rydberg atom, we can actually now image the, the electron cloud around the, uh, uh, around the nucleus. So this is a real image of a hydrogen atom, not, not the ground state, but the electron in an excited state. So it's actually a box with a hole in the middle, basically. <laughs> but we can now see the, see the electron distribution and see its fuzziness. 
So a big point in a, a central thing in, in quantum mechanics is Pauli's exclusion principle, which is the statement that two electrons can't be in the same state. Roughly speaking, that says two electrons can't be in the same place. And that, of course, is responsible for the stability of matter around us and uh, is central. So when, uh, when Newton formulated his laws of, of, of motion, he, he came up with the idea of the normal force, the force that prevents me from falling through the floor to the center of the Earth. So it was an empirical observation of Newton, a force that if I push, if I'm standing on the platform, gravity is pulling me down. So there's a force pulling me inwards. And if I'm not, if I'm stationary, Newton said that there must be another force that is oppo opposing the gravity. And that's the neutral, that's, he called it the normal force, that when you stand on something or press on something, it pushes back on you. The law of action equals reaction. <coughs> But in fact, this is a quantum mechanics is all around us. And in fact, Newton's normal force is, is actually just the Pauli exclusion principle. So the thing that prevents me falling, gravity pulling me through the floor down to the center of the Earth is not electromagnetism. It's not, not that the atoms have charges and they're repelling charges. I mean, the atom is 99.9% .9 empty space. Um, what is preventing me falling to the center of the Earth is the Pauli exclusion principle, which is saying that the electrons in the sole of my shoe, they can't occupy the same place as the electrons in the floor. And so this very important thing that two electrons can't be in the same place, the Pauli exclusion principle is actually fundamental to stability of matter and everything we see around us. So, of course, people say we don't see quantum mechanics around us, but quantum mechanics, we can't understand the world around us without quantum mechanics, and the, this is a very simple example. Okay. So the Pauli exclusion principle says that two electrons can't be in the same state. And what defines the state of an electron? So, it, in addition to its position, the electron has an additional internal degree of freedom called spin. It's like a little spinning top. And uh, the, the direction of the spin is like the direction of the angular momentum, the spin of a top. And we can put two electrons in the same box only if their spins are pointing in exactly opposite direction. So we can't tell which direction they point in, just that they're opposite. And if we swap the electrons around, another feature of the same Pauli exclusion principle says that if, if, if the two electrons are swapped around, something called the wave function, the quantum state changes sign. The quantum state is, has some value, which is a, a number, a complex number. But in general, if I exchange the two electrons, they... Um, uh, the, the, the sign of this wave function, it's called, has to change. And that's why they can't be up, up, because up, up, minus, up, up would be zero. <laughs> okay. But it doesn't matter whether the two electrons are pointing up and down this way or up and down this way. Okay. And this is actually entanglement. The maximally entangled state of, two, of the two electrons is just the, the spin up plus spin down combination of two electrons in a in the same box. And of course, in high school chemistry, we see this system of boxes. If you've done high school chemistry, you'll see that you understand the Mendeleev uh, periodic table by, by putting an up and a down spin electron on the ground floor, which has one room. Then uh, the second floor has, has uh, uh, eight rooms divided into a, so four rooms divided into two plus three and then so on. So this atomic structure is basically putting electrons into boxes, obeying the Pauli exclusion principle. And if you're a chemist, I'm not sure about today, but certainly most of the, most of the time in chemists, this is about as much quantum mechanics as you need to know to do chemistry to some extent anyway. <laughs> you need to know a little bit more details, but uh, the basic details are all there in that. So the chemical bond that binds atoms into interesting clusters like us is actually a maximally entangled state. So the chemical bond is formed by 
putting two electrons in between a pair of atoms. Uh, and since they sit in the, this, this same region, they can only sit in that region in the, if, they're both, if one is up and the other is down, or more correctly, this mixture of up, down, minus, down, up. So a chemical bond is also a box that contains uh, two electrons, and they can only be filled if they're completely entangled, so their spins point in opposite directions. Okay. So the central theme in, the, in these uh, new approach to quantum physics is actually the property of entanglement. So actually, when I studied uh, physics, you know, people didn't really talk about entanglement. It was, entanglement was a kind of issue that Einstein had raised, and, and philosophers who were worrying about issues in quantum mechanics and free will and the like would talk about entanglement. But regular physicists were kind of practical people, and they didn't worry about these kind of philosophical issues that were being raised. So entanglement is actually now recognized as a central property of quantum mechanics, and it, which was first pointed out by Einstein. And nowadays, it's become viewed not as a philosophical issue about quantum mechanics, but the fuel which can drive a possible future quantum information technology. Basically, the, the, all the ideas of quantum uh, quantum information processing or quantum computers is based on the idea of harnessing entanglement as its fuel. So despite making an important early contribution to quantum mechanics, which is what Einstein got his Nobel Prize for, not relativity, by 1935 Einstein had rejected quantum theory and he pointed out this key property predicted by quantum theory, which he felt was so weird it basically had to be wrong. And he called it Spukhafte Fernwirkung, rather kind of insulting title. Spooky action of distance is the translation. But Schrodinger thought about this, and uh, he came up with a, a much more neutral word, Verschränkung. Uh, in English, we call it entanglement. Actually, entanglement is a very interesting word because uh, pretty well every language has adopted a different word, an unrelated word. In, in French, it's called intrication. I knew a few of the other languages. So people invented their own language word for entanglement and didn't just adopt some kind of English word, perhaps because its origin is, is not English, Verschränkung. But uh, anyway, so entanglement is the thing in quantum mechanics. And Schrodinger kind of neutral, also thought about it a great deal. So this came to a head around 1935 when Einstein was trying to find an argument to, to, to consign quantum mechanics to the dustbin of history. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, go back. Yeah. So uh, they came up with a, a thought experiment called the einstein podolsky rosen experiment. And he was worried about what would happen if I took this entangled pair of electrons, which were 50% up and 50% 50, 50 up down and 50% down up, and stretch them until they were far away from each other. And quantum mechanics says, if I, if I measure the direction of the spin of one, one of these part electrons, the other one will always be found to be pointing in the opposite direction. And Einstein said, well, you know, if the, he wanted the spin directions to have been fixed at the time the two electrons spread apart. Uh, and, but quantum mechanics says, no, no, nothing happens until you do the measurement. So this sounds like instantaneous action at a distance. He thought, you know, can you, this seems to violate relativity. And since Einstein loved relativity, he didn't like this aspect of quantum mechanics. Uh, the answer is no, it doesn't uh, violate relativity because you actually cannot transmit information this way. You can actually easily make something move faster than the speed of light. I take a, a laser, shine it at the surface of the moon and just move the laser. The spot on the surface of the moon will travel at larger than the speed of light if I do it fast enough, but nothing is actually traveling from one point to another point on the surface of the moon. It's only apparent that the, the spot which is really produced by the laser is moving. So there's no information, no, no information can be transmitted between people faster than the speed of light. So this does not actually violate uh, Einstein's 
relativity. Anyway, so what happened was that one of the collaborators, Podolsky, went to the New York Times, and presumably no country had been invaded that day or something, so there was an empty space on the front page. So this made the front page of the New York Times that Einstein was attacking quantum theory and, uh, and it was gone. <laughs> Actually, Einstein was very upset. He never talked to Podolsky again. Even. He kept on working with the other guy, Rosen, but he felt that, uh, he said in German, that physicists should not be washing their dirty linen in public. <laughs> he didn't like that Rosen and Podolsky had gone to the press with this thing. But anyway, so this, but this is a central attack of quantum mechanics. And so in this picture, oops. In this uh, thing, you have a pair of entangled particles which are confined inside the box that we talked about. And if you now switch off the walls of the box suddenly, so the particle, there's nothing holding them in, they will fly apart, and actually they'll fly apart in opposite directions because they have to conserve their momentum. So they'll move apart in opposite directions, and uh, um, if, if you wait long enough, then you'll have created, and they don't hit anything on the way, you'll have created this long-distance entanglement pair because they, they started entangled, they'll be, still be entangled. And, uh, of course, uh, Einstein said if you did his measurements, you would prove quantum mechanics wrong. Now, the measurements were not made till after Einstein had passed away, but various people thought about them, and uh, Einstein's paradox was thought about by David Bohm, and then later John Bell in particular, we formulated them in a much more precise way for experimentalists to, to test things. And then, I say later, then a um, number of people who shared the, the two people who, who shared the Nobel Prize uh, this last year with Zeilinger for fundamental quantum mechanics experiments, Clauser and then Alan Aspect in particular finally made the, the cleanest uh, experiments to test the, the theorems of Bell that showed that if you, did the if you did a certain measurement and found a certain result, it would disprove Einstein's worries about quantum mechanics. And indeed, quantum mechanics passed this test of flying colors. So entanglement does occur and can be made over large distances, but entanglement over, while it's prevalent everywhere inside the chemical bond, is very fragile when it's spread over large distances against decoherence, which means becoming entangled with the environment. So Aspey's experiments used photons rather than electrons, uh, but two states of polarization of light, but... You know, nowadays, using modern optical fibers, entangled, they're now called EPR photon pairs, separated by oceans apart, can now be produced. And I guess uh, in China, they've uh, collaborators actually with people here, I think, have, have made it uh, entanglement between the Earth and a satellite in space. And in fact, I was seeing on the top of the, this, uh, the, the, the EQQ building, <laughs> Uh, which I visited this morning, there's a, a telescope, there's a, a, a they're doing entanglement between here and something on the mountains outside Vienna, except today there was a crane blocking the, blocking the path of the entanglement. <laughs> okay, so entanglement uh, over long distances with photons has been established. And, uh, okay. So what is, the, what is quantum information? So classical information is stored in a bit, which is basically a switch which is either up or down, on or off. Uh, so this is the binary numbers that we see in, in computers. And uh, a bit is actually a large number. The on switch is a large can be viewed as a large number of atoms or spins pointing all in one direction. And the down, say, zero, off on the switch could be a load of these spins pointing, all pointing in the opposite direction. So they're large numbers of these things, so they all behave according to everyday classical mechanics. They don't want to fluctuate, they all keep each other pointing in the same direction. But quantum information should be stored in a single qubit, a single one of these spins, which is by itself the elementary quantum thing, which could be a spin, it could be the box which is empty or full. <coughs> And the crucial thing is that the, 
the, any system, uh, so any system with two states is equivalent to the spin. So we can think of the spin one up and zero down, but the spin can be in a can point in a mixture of states. It, it, it's your choice with how to measure it, and the the general state of the spin will be can always be viewed as pointing in some particular direction. So it's like a, a it points in a direction on the surface of a sphere. This is called the block sphere. So you can see that the information c content of uh, a single spin is much richer than just up or down. It's actually got the ability to point in an arbitrary direction. But if we measure it, we can only we have to choose a direction to measure it in, and then it'll only be up or down along the direction of measurement. And the Bell and the Bell uh, theorems started to you know answer these questions about whether things were determined when the EPR pair split apart by postponing the decision about which which direction, which axis to measure the spin along till after the, uh, the electrons, are sp the particles are split apart. So there's still a few, the only loose item in, the, in, the, in those arguments are this, the whole question of free will, which I know not to get into. So it assumes that the experimentalist has the ability to arbitrarily decide which direction to uh, measure in. Other people would say, well, you know, quantum mechanics is uh, deterministic, so the direction he was going to measure in was determined at the beginning of the Big Bang or something like that. So, but those are the kind of philosophical questions that, that practicing physicists, I think, are well advised to avoid. You know, I'm not going to tell you to live your daily life according to whether quantum mechanics allows free will or not. <laughs> but anyway, so the... The only exception is this free will clause that some people that that the experimentalist was predetermined which 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 way he was going to which axis he was going to choose, which I don't think we need to think about too much. So classically, stored information is unaffected by reading it out and copying it. Right. So this whole issue about you know copyright songs, you know you can you can or software, you know you just copy it. <laughs> uh, but Quantum, in fact, classical information is rather difficult to get rid of. You have to do work to, to hide, to destroy classical information. Just when you want to recycle your old mobile phone, you have to do a lot of work to kind of make sure that all your bank account de details have been erased from it. So the qubit stored information, this quantum information, is much richer than classical, but it's much, much more fragile. So one of the things is that the qubits, they can't be copied. You can't clone them into multiple copies, but in fact, you can do something called teleportation to them, which uh, at least was experimentally realized. One of the two people who finally showed the teleportation protocols, which had, uh, by Charles Bennett and people, people were, was actually Zeilinger, who, who was one of the two who realized uh, teleportation back here in, in Austria. So the no cloning property says basically that you can't copy a qubit to get a second qubit. So here is, here is a, uh, the qubit we want to have a copy of. Here is a blank qubit with no information in it. And, we, and the no cloning theorem says it's not possible just to get two copies of this. So the best we can actually do to this is to measure the qubit and use the information to produce a copy of it. But in making the copy, we've destroyed the first one, the information in the first one, which seems like a, a pointless thing to do, uh, except we can transport it. And this is where we start to see some of the ideas of entanglement being a, a quantum resource. So a quantum, an entangled pair of objects, spins, is called a Bell pair. This is a maximally entangled pair, which is kind of like the up, down, minus, down, up state of a chemical bond. And we have our local target qubit that we want to copy. And the teleportation idea is I stretch this thing. So I, this is, a, this is a, a remote distance away from it. And I take one of the two halves of this remote pair and stretch it or bring it over to the, be next door to the local target qubit. This would be like for the thing on top of the, the, the quantum institute I visited, the target would be on the other side of the valley on the hills behind Vienna. So I've made this entangled thing, 
what you actually do, the, the person can do a joint measurement at this location of measure a property which is not a single property of both of either of these two things, but a joint property of the, of the two qubits. And he can do a measurement which destroys the thing here, or rather it puts them into a known state after he does the measurement by choosing an axis to measure things along. But he can then communicate. The, the protocol says I've got a measurement with one of four possibilities. And he, and he will randomly, as he do the measurement, he will he will get some possibility. He then telephones to the person at the origin, the other side of the, of the, of the, of the long-range entangled pair, and tells him what result he got. And by choosing one of four different protocols based on which of the four possible results you got, the, the, the remote operator can then uh, reproduce exactly whatever this initial state, unknown state of this qubit was. So that's the famous teleportation. Uh, but it results on, it's based, it requires some classical communication over the telephone line or whatever, which cannot go faster than the speed of light. So there's no way you, no, no contradiction with Einstein in any of this stuff. Okay, so this leads to this basic idea that entanglement is the fuel for quantum information processing. But it's remote entanglement over larger distances that's the fuel, not local entanglement. So how do we produce entanglement? Any two systems will become weakly entangled if they're put in contact with each other. But it's much more difficult to make a, a completely entangled state, 100% entangled state like this bell pair. So in the chemical bond, the, the Pauli principle forces uh, complete entanglement. But for objects which are not in the same box, it, it that doesn't do it for us. We have to do something to, to create uh, entanglement between remote objects. And it's quite delicate. What we do, we take two states in a, in a known, two, two bits in a, in a known state, both say pointing up. Then we bring them into contact with what we call a gate. And we have to switch this gate on to bring them into contact and switch it off at another precise time. And the gate will cause this initial state to vary. So if we switch it off at exactly the right time, it'll be in a 50-50 mixture of up, down, plus down, up. But this is a very delicate procedure. And we're never going to get it 100% right. We're going to get it 99% right if our equipment is good enough. But so you can see it's, it's actually quite difficult to produce uh, entanglement, a bell pair like this. Okay. And the topology will turn out to be, uh, in some sense, a robust uh, way of doing things. So in now to switch subjects to the other thing. In 1980, the condensed matter physicist who studied solid and liquid matter, which is not, 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 not gases or elementary particles, but solids or liquids, they found two weird systems, uh, which turn out to be what we now call topological quantum systems. And they turn out to be a new kind of condensed matter which quantum entanglement plays some kind of important role. And those were something which I worked on to do with magnetic, magnet, little one-dimensional chains of magnets. And the other one, quite independently, uh, with no obvious connection between the two at the time, was the quantum Hall effect, which got a Nobel Prize very quickly for, for Klaus von Klitzing. But in the meantime, these things have been united into one framework, and many, many more kinds of quantum topological matter have been found in the last decade. So we have the image of the hidden, the peaks of the iceberg, but, but a huge amount of extra stuff was waiting to be found later. So what's topological matter? <coughs> so topological matter differs from ordinary matter because it's got properties, which are, in fact, entanglement properties which can be described by whole numbers, integers, like minus one, two, et cetera. So you might say ordinary matter is described by a boring number, like zero, one, although mathematically I don't think one can say they're really boring. But, but states of matter described by different whole numbers, they can't smoothly change from one to the other. So if I have a, a region where I can classify this 
the, the, the behavior of the matter in this region by minus two, and it's surrounded outside by a region of zero, there has to be something, there has to be a boundary between uh, which it changes from, from zero to the non-trivial number. So one of the interesting things in topological matter is they generally always have something interesting having up the boundary between them and the uh, regular kinds of matter. So topological properties of materials, they cannot change continuously. And that, what, that makes their properties robust to small amounts of disorder or dirt. So this is very different from the current silicon-based technology where the computer chips have to be made in these ultra-clean rooms where the workers are all wearing these kind of space suits. The workers are not so much wearing the space suits to protect themselves from the nasty chemicals involved in, in making these devices. They're to protect, protect tiny bits of hair or spit or whatever from the workers contaminating the silicon sheet, which makes it worthless, right? So you have to have ultra-clean systems, and of course, technology is developed in a remarkable ultra-clean way to be able to make these, these wafers of silicon with, with, uh, with no dirt on them and things, because they get ruined by little bits of dirt. So topology is something more robust, because small amounts of dirt can't hurt it. And the classic example in mathematics of topology is something called the classification of surfaces by what's called the genus, which is actually the number of holes in a surface. So a shape of a surface like a sphere with no holes in it, you can easily distort it with small forces, but to turn it into a donut with one hole, you have to do some violence. And we can see that counting the number of holes on the surface, at least counting them when you can consider the surface as a continuous thing, which is on the scale much larger than atoms, there's no such thing as a fractional hole, right? Holes are either one hole or two holes or no holes. There's no, thing, no such thing as 0.3 plus or minus some number of holes. So integers are very precise. <coughs> and geometric properties such as curvature of a surface are local properties. But it turns out that integrals over local geometric properties can characterize the number of holes in a surface, the global topology. Uh, so Gauss discovered the relation between topology and geometry, and he felt it was the most unexpected discovery of all the ones that he made. He called it his theorema egregium, which I guess means something like his remarkable theorem. Uh, so he found something, of course, in a high school, you learn, you have to memorize all these formulas in geometry when you suffer through this stuff. But you learn that the surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared where it's radius. And you maybe have to you remember that to try to pass your exam and possibly get mixed up with pi r squared, the area of a disk. But anyway, Gauss invented or characterized the intrinsic curvature of a surface, a two-dimensional surface, by having two different, you can inscribe two different circles around it. So that's called the radii of curvature. And so Gauss's uh, uh, intrinsic curvature is the product of two radii of curvature, which on the sphere is one over r squared. So Gauss discovered the remarkable theorem of Gauss is that four pi r squared times one over r squared is four pi. Of course, that's trivially true for a sphere. But it's actually non-trivially true if I deform the sphere into a, into a rugby ball or a banana. As long as I don't make any holes in it, I can deform this surface and it'll still have, I will now have a much more complicated integral to do the curvature integral over the surface, but it'll still be exactly four pi. So of course, a, a cruel math teacher could give homework to his students with very nasty surfaces to integrate over, but he can easily mark it because he knows the answer is always four pi. <laughs> uh, so it turns out, of course, if you make a hole in it, if you look at this case here, you've, so the thing that people doing experiments and topological materials do, they typically, especially if they're experimentalists, always show a, a movie where a coffee cup contain, uh, changes continuously to a donut or a bagel. Uh, and the, uh, basically, if you look at this thing, the bagel, the, but all points on the surface of the sphere have what's called positive curvature. The two radii of curvature are the same. But on the inside of the bagel, one of the curves you would, one of the circles you would draw would be a cross section. The other circle would be the 
the hole, so they have radii pointing in opposite directions. So the inner part of the bagel has negative curvature. And, in the, and if you integrate over, they exactly balance to give you zero. If you put two holes in, you get, uh, this was shown at my Nobel's uh, press conference or something, it was called the Swedish pretzel, which is really not true. It's a Santa Lucia bun when the holes get filled up when they bake it, so it's not really a genuine pretzel. Uh, and this can map into this curious co cup. This was a coffee cup, this thing's called the loving cup. Uh, but the true pretzel, has, where you integral this 8 pi, has three holes, and the corresponding cup is this. So I've asked people, no one's quite sure what to call this. Some people have suggested it should be called a California loving cup. <laughs> but anyway, the, 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 the theorem of, um, of, of Gauss and then Bonnet was turned into a much more abstract form by a uh, Chinese-American uh, mathematician, uh, Chern, and he formulated it. Mathematicians like to make a much more abstract formulation of things. So this was a, an abstract curvature integrated over an abstract surface, but still the basic same theorem. And actually, the, there's no Nobel Prize for mathematics, uh, allegedly, because uh, Nobel's wife had an affair with a mathematician, and that displeased Nobel. But um, the, there's a medal. There's various medals. The Arbel Medal is uh, the most and you can't get the, the, the um, Fields Medal if you're over 40. <laughs> so there's ageism in this thing. They decided you, So they did invent some Nobel-like medals for people's lifetime achievements who didn't qualify for Fields. And one of the two is the Chern Medal, and it's got the gauss bonnet Chern formula right on the back. So this is at the, the one the connection with quantum mechanics comes from this mathematical generalization. So in recent years, we've realized that quantum condensed matter can exhibit unexpected properties, which you can exhibit in some way with long-range quantum entanglement. So trivially entangled objects, if I cut them in half, the quantum states are really just a product of the right half and the left half. So they just separate naturally into two separate halves, quantum mechanically. The, the topological states have some kind of strange edge state around them. So if I try to separate them into two halves, the edge state sort of resists at first. But when I finally do cut it, you'll find that the, the new open edges I created still have these surface states. I can't, get, I can't avoid having a boundary between topological and non-topological reasons. So in some sense, this is due to internal entanglement along the system. So topologically trivial states of atomic matter can just be assembled by bringing atoms together, or moving them together, and, stick, and putting them next door to each other. But non-trivial states, they can't be smoothly connected to isolated atoms. But when I bring them together, the, the little boxes or electron orbitals which are centered on the atoms have to get uh, rearranged in interesting ways to form chemical bonds. But the non-topological things can't be assembled. So in heavier atoms, uh, the electrons want to go into these boxes, but in things like the, the D shell or F shell, the, the interactions between the electrons, the Pauli principle minimizes the interactions if they all first go in power pointing in the same way. So they keep out of, their other, of, out of the other boxes completely. And uh, so they like to add up in a way. So the total spin of a, of a magnet a magnetic atom tends to be adding up a whole lot of parallel uh, spins. So if we, we've assigned the number one half because of angular momentum corresponds to a, a single spin. So the total spin of, of this magnetic atom has to be an integer number, 2s times a half. And there was a big controversy about uh, atomic chains, uh, which, which I worked on. And, in, and I discovered that people thought that magnetic states essentially did not have any entanglement. We could order the spins pointing in some direction, so they, so they uh, line up. If you want to pick up a ferromagnet, you have to line everything up in the, positive in the same direction, so it picks up a paper clip. This one here is an anti-ferromagnet, so it doesn't pick up paper clips, but the spins are alternatively up, down, up, down, up, down. And these are two, this is a spin one 
These are spin ones, but they're going one minus one, one minus one. But the crucial point is there's no entanglement between the two. I've just assembled them. So the unexpected model uh, state of this spin one chain turned out to be have an entanglement between neighboring, neighboring atoms, like a chemical bond. Uh, you can so the, these spin ones, they break up into two, into two spin halves, one of which joins with its neighbor. And the, and the weird thing about this is that when you join them all together, there's a free, there's an unpaired spin, half spin on one side and unspared half spin at the other side. This is very typical of topological states. At the boundary where it stops being topological, there's something strange at the boundary. So this was like half a spin. Okay, okay half of a spin one is a spin half. Uh, the atoms all have spin one, but okay. Anyway, this was very unexpected at the time. And uh, anyway, it was rejected by the Magnuson community, but then experiment came along. And in science, uh, arguments between theorists are basically should be settled by experiment. And these, ch these arguments about quantum ideas between theorists often have inspired material scientists to get into When something is controversial, it's interesting. And uh, you know, experimentalists, would, they're, they're, the first thing they would like to do is prove a theorist wrong. <laughs> But okay, the second prize is proving a theorist right, at least making a definite answer to something. And uh, in fact, this whole problem got so many people worked up about it, lots of new theoretical techniques, which are now used in, in, uh, in understanding quantum states, got developed too. So controversy is actually a very powerful thing in science. It, it inspires people to get involved in the issue on one side or another and, and come up with new ways to, to kind of decide whether something is right or wrong. But anyway, so the, 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 the meme of this thing is you can say that, that hand, you know, hands, if, you're not a, if you haven't had an accident, you know, people have two hands. So this hands come in pairs in some way. But if I actually line up people and make them all hold hands together, in a straight line, I'll find there's two unpaired hands, one at either side of this chain of people. If I split the chain of people down the middle into two chains of people, I will get the chain of people will always be ended, ended by two un, an unpaired hand at either way. And that's the topological, simple topological principle. It turns out to be the same principle shows up in, in some of the uh, uh, quantum states used for, that people hope to use for quantum computing. Okay, so this was actually one of the earliest um, things, and it's actually on my Nobel certificate. They drew the picture of the spin chain, except this actually is somebody else's a realization of, of, of my idea, not, not the original one, but anyway. So the, the quantum Hall effect, on the other hand, was the other thing that was discovered, and that was perhaps the clearest example of topological states. So that got the the medal very quickly from Faust von Klitzing, and it's actually democratized the kilogram. So quantum you know, science is useful, even abstract science like this. What Faust Klitzing found was that, that he measured some electrical uh, conductivity of some devices, and for this kind of devices which involved electrons in a stuck on a two-dimensional surface with a magnetic field which makes them go around in little orbits, he found that the conductivity, the whole conductance, was um, an integer whole number times fundamental constants, the charge of the electron and Planck's constant. And this is, at the time, it wasn't, this was, you know, you never expect a measurement to give you a whole number. You expect some, some accuracy with points, but this was found to be, you know, 10 digits of precision, finally, when the systems got better. And the, the measurement shows up in these kind of, this ought to be a straight line, classically, but it breaks up into a staircase with, with, with these precise values at the flat point. So this has been used to, um, to democratize the kilogram, right? Uh, Napoleon introduced the kilogram and had a piece of uh, platinum sitting in a, in a vault in Paris. Uh, like, uh, so if anyone, you know, symbolizing the French Empire of the time, I guess, if anyone suspected their market trader of cheating them, the, only re the final resource was to, to take it and, and knock on the door of the, of the, the uh, academy in France or whatever where the kilogram was stored and say, can we check this against your kilogram? 
But now because quantum mechanics has shown these topological things, we've actually, everyone can build a kilogram. We can build a quantum kilogram to, to, to send the, the French one into the museum. Uh, and um, everyone will get exactly the same answer with the quantum kilogram. Uh, so because it's based on topology. Okay. So the topological nature of this effect it took a long time, it took some time to discover. These electrons go around in little closed orbits on the surface. They go around one way, I've drawn them going clockwise. But if they're at the edge of the system, they will bounce along it. They'll, they, will, they will hit the edge and be reflected, and they will go around in an anti-clockwise direction along the edge. So something funny happens at the edge, and that's a clear indication, finally, that it's a topological thing that we didn't realize at the time. Uh, indeed, the energy quantum mechanics says anything going in a, in a periodic motion must be quantized. So in the, in the, mean, the energy levels in the middle of this system are quantized. But at the edge of the system, they're messed around by, by banging into the edge. And that causes the energies to go up. So the level at which you have to fill the, the states for a given number of electrons is, is fixed in the, at the edge. And before, we, people thought this, had, this required dirty systems. But once it was topological, you can get the effect in a, a clean system. And you see it's, you can in, it's in principle would be due to edge effects. So this initial discovery, which showed that this, this number, this, this plateau value, was an integer times e, over, e squared over h, was actually <laughs> so shortly after people had yes, decided, yes, we've discovered why this works. Then it was actually experimentally found that sometimes it was a third times e squared over h. So it was back to the drawing board. And it turns out it depends on the charge interesting objects form in this so-called fractional Hall effect. It has uh, an amazingly simple toy model wave function for it was invented, and it actually is correct. And you can see uh, the device in which this was measured is you know you wouldn't get a job at Intel if you showed this as your soldering ability, right? <laughs> but because of the because this thing is so forgiving, you can get away with this type of device and actually see the see the effect in it, right? So the prize for this was shared between these people, the two experimentalists, and Laughlin, the theorist. The guy who actually made a device, unfortunately, they could only have three people in a Nobel Prize, so he didn't get included. But they did the measurements, the other top two. <laughs> OK, so this has all kinds of weird stuff in it, uh, stuff called fractional charge. The excitations of it, because it didn't fit the usual electron picture where it was an integer times e squared over h, you can write that as, as p e squared o. You can write this as multiples of e or fractions of e. And it turns out this object supports the simple case, the first case found supports objects with one third of a charge of an electron inside them. Nothing to do with quarks. It's uh, to do with uh, what we call fractional, uh, fractional charges. And these are things that also don't behave like regular electrons when you interchange a pair of them. The Pauli principle says interchange two electrons, you get minus sign, which is why you had to have up, down, minus, down, up. You get other fractions if you take one around each other. but you, it depends on whether you exchange them in a clockwise or anti-clockwise uh, case, so they uh, can't go on the sphere. So this is what, so this is, uh, you know, kind of unexpected type new stuff, weird kind of particles which are neither fermions or bosons, and this stuff has all been, interestingly, experimentally kind of uh, the the funny, what we call braiding statistics when you wind these things around each other have have been experimentally demonstrated. So Laughlin states, the kind of early quantum Hall states, are examples of uh, what we call abelian states. So they, these are not useful for quantum computing, but they do remarkable things. But more remarkable than these, it turns out, the states which have much more interesting things when you exchange some of the defects, which are called non-abelian. And these are the things which can hide quantum information in the entanglement structure. And some of these support something called universal quantum computing. The ones which we've found, in principle, can support a restricted form of quantum computing. And we're still waiting. We found toy models that do this, but we're still waiting for real materials that can, uh, in principle, could do this. So what happens here is 
that you have these different kind of little vortices or little holes in the material, and if they move around each other, um, information can get, get manipulated. So uh, what's happening here, so here's a picture. These, these materials, the non-abelian ones, contain something that you can't create locally. You can only create a double object, uh, kind of like in EPR. So you have to start off with a double object. You can't create a single one of these objects. So you can only make them single by pulling them apart. Uh, but once they're pulled apart, they leave behind a history of how they were made. So I got this picture here and this picture here. If I just look at the white dots, they look exactly the same. But this one was created by pulling a pair apart, this pair apart, and this pair apart. Well, this one was created by, by making the pairs this other way. And these hidden information here, which is an entanglement structure inside them, corresponds to two different states of the qubit. In this particular example, this one corresponds to the qubit being up. This, the one corresponds to the direction of the qubit being along the equator. And the information processing is actually by moving these things around. And if I move them around, if I get the next, uh, let's go to the next one. Okay. Let's go back a minute. I'm almost at the end. Um, if I move them around, then I'm actually processing the direction of the qubit. So there's hidden information. The information is stored not at the position of the particles, but somewhere in between. So it's non-locally stored. So it turns out if I punch a hole in this thing, I take a, a gun and shoot a hole in it, the chances of that shot, that, that, that damage, removing the information is very small because the information is stored over a much larger area than the, uh, the hole I make with a local probe. So one of the things that, you know, cosmic ray going through will disrupt a regular qubit. This is, these things are stable. The information content is stable because it's, it's hidden. And so I can't, with a local measurement, tell the difference. All I can do is know where the white dots are. I can't tell what the entanglement pattern is, so I can't disrupt it by interacting with the environment. And so the quantum program, the toy model quantum program for this is, is braiding these things around each other in some controlled pattern and changing one or more states of qubits. It turns out every, I have to have at least four of them to get, the first two don't count. Every, every other two of these things I add, which by splitting something apart creates an extra qubit. So, uh, the number of qubits uh, is equal to the number of paired objects. And when I split them apart, then I can do a lot of rearrangement. And so there's a huge information content in this thing as I build it up. So this, is, um, this was initially seen in these quantum Hall states or, or seen that could occur in these quantum Hall states, but they've approved, they require high magnetic fields and very low temperatures. It's been very difficult to work with them. But it was actually realized that this principle could occur this type of things could be, could be seen in other systems too. And they're now called Majorana zero modes, and they're central to at least a Microsoft attempt to produce quantum computers. So people were very, um, you know, they thought this was going to work out early, and actually it was predicted in advance that 2017 would be the year that braiding was achieved, but it wasn't. But actually, it appears Microsoft, I've heard from people that they, they claim there's more progress, and, they understand a lot of things that, that made it fail before. Um, but what's going on here? We go back to the issue of boxes. So this, in 1937, one of the, one of the uh, mysterious founders of quantum mechanics is this young guy, Majorana, who, 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 uh, who came up with this idea called Majorana fermions. And... Uh, he actually never wrote his paper up, but Fermi basically wrote it for him. <laughs> I guess he was one of these brilliant geniuses who was a bit difficult about writing things up. And uh, sh shortly afterwards, he disappeared, <laughs> taking a boat journey somewhere. <laughs> so it's a kind of mysterious life of Majorana. But initially, this was, this was uh, supposed to be something for neutrinos, to understand neutrinos. Uh, but it's actually had a lot of ex application in superconductivity and now in quantum matter. And the remarkable thing that in the Majorana modes is I've got this box we started off, which was either empty or filled. 
But the Marana mode actually shows that you can actually separate this thing into two half boxes, two half orbitals. And uh, two half orbitals is a weird, a half box is a weird thing. So the question is, when I split the thing into the two half boxes, I can't tell by looking at the split pair whether they were originally empty or filled. And that's exactly the picture I showed. So this actually, the single orbital can be split into two half orbitals, and there has to be a, a long-range entanglement cont which contains the information about whether they were originally empty or filled between them. And that's the heart of, of the simplest form of a topological quantum computer. So again, and the, and the computer program is executed by, by moving these half boxes around each other, and those, those mix up or braid the, the entanglement patterns which are in the which are invisible, except when you look very closely, they're invisible to uh, the exterior world. And no delicate timing is needed in all this stuff, so it's actually topologically stable. So this is actually part of the, the beautiful dream of topologically protected qubits. Uh, on paper, it, it actually provides a very satisfying answer to issues of scalability and robustness. Um, but it's been taking a long time to appear. But, you know, it's fusion power looks very good on paper, but all these kind of little flies in the ointment occur when you try to build your tokamak. But fusion appears to be, you know, a, a, things happening these days, right? So actually, personally, I do believe that this is a, a realistic dream. And let me just show you the connection. In this. So, so this model has another, a, a similar way to split the orbitals comes about by putting a, a, a one-dimensional... A wire, a little thread of a semiconducting material in contact with a superconductor. And the superconductor has this ability to, to split the electron orbitals locally into two halves. Well, this is purely formal. So you can write the electron operators as so-called Majorana fermions. Basically, it's like a real and imaginary part of an electron operator. Majorana fermions are real fermions. But this is just a pure kind of theorist thing. It's nothing true. But the superconductor can allow the orbital to be locally split into two pieces. Um, uh, but basically, the mechanism here, they can now recombine. So you can, you can split, if you split an orbital into a red, a purple piece and a green piece along this chain by coupling it to the superconductor, they can recombine in the middle, red and purple and green, to form regular orbitals, which do nothing interesting. But then you get left with half an orbital on either side. So it's actually the same mechanism of joining hands with something at the edge, except this is much more remarkable than splitting a spin one into two spin halves. This is splitting a filled or an empty orbital into two half orbitals with, with undetermined filling. Okay, So this is the interesting paradigm. So one of this is one of the current approaches that Microsoft is pushing. There are other equally interesting approaches to um, uh, quantum computing. There's IBM's there's transmit, there's superconducting qubits, nitrogen vacancies in diamond, etc., ion traps, lots of very promising kind of qubits. So, you know, lots of things are happening, so I'm not sure what will finally occur, but what I would like to say there have actually been some very recent developments using these, uh, these other com s systems where two groups about uh, a month ago both made, pub both, both made claims, one at Google using superconducting qubits, while there are uh, another, another kind of startup company which is partly based in Munich using trapped ions. They both claim to have produced synthetic systems which are models built out of qubits which are which may or may not, which, which they claim can implement some of these uh, non-abelian braidings. And so, so it's a, a start to actually showing the reality of what we know from theoretical calculations about storing and processing information. So the moral of all this story anyway has been that, that, that a lot of different communities have to come together in this material. So the, some of this stuff comes from building toy models which were kind of explicit enough to show interesting stuff. And, but then he needed the mathematical people to kind of come up with to understand why this stuff that was happening in the toy models was, was there, which was unexpected. But then you, of course, needed the 
the, the main people in this, the material scientists who actually build the, some stuff and build these models and, uh, and, and show that you could actually bring some of this stuff to, to reality. And they all have to communicate, which is difficult. But anyway, to close up this thing, I have this kind of motivational message for people going into science that actually the best discoveries are always unexpected discoveries. I had no idea what I would find when I worked on this stuff. Colin Klitzing had no idea he was going to find what he found. Because basically the most, ex the most amazing and unexpected things, none of the really smart people know about it, right? If people knew it was out there, the smart people would have immediately gone and found them all, right? So the only way you've got a chance of finding something remarkable is that no one, including yourself, knows about it, to know it's out there. So you're going to have to find it by an accidental process of good luck, that your research takes you past something interesting, and uh, you view it, you may be walking along the path kicking the dust, but if you don't look down, you won't notice that you're, you've kicked up a huge diamond. You may walk on by, right? So you have to have the times when you see something unexpected or unusual happening in your search to be not completely focused on a complete goal, but to, when something weird shows up, to at least take a little bit of time to try to understand it. Because most of the time, it'll just be something weird that's of no importance. But very occasionally, that's where these kind of things that no one expected to find We'll come up. So there's plenty of things that we think are true, uh, but we think we understand, and probably among those things, there are a few things that we don't understand because we've, we've misled ourselves that we understand them, and that's what these kind of new kind of discoveries will show a, a new way of looking at it. And of course, if you find such a thing, you've got to have the preparation to see that you've found something interesting, <laughs> otherwise you won't know what to do with it, and you probably have to fight for it because there's, there's certainly pushback because certainly my papers on my subject were rejected as, as contrary to fundamental principles of basic science and stuff like that. So it was until the experimentalists actually verified it when people had to eat their words then they decided that was great. So it was very good for me that people thought this idea was so crazy it can't be true <laughs> and then it was true. <laughs> anyway, it's a bit like uh, anyway entanglement or whatever. It's uh, so the other thing you have to do, I guess, in, if you're doing this stuff, is one has to try and explain this to the public. I don't know how much public is here. But the importance of basic science is really, you know, people always say we have to have applied science. But all the, if this actually leads to some new technology, it came from basic science. So basic science is certainly the key thing. And we have to, the funding agencies always like to see a nice goal somewhere. What's it going to lead to? <laughs> And so we have to kind of try to do outreach. Thank you.